I mean, I remember a lot of my colleagues at Oxford when I was a PhD student, my fellow PhD students, offline would, would confess to these feelings. And we all had, we all loved the animals we were studying. You know, I had people, my, some of my friends studied capybaras, others hunting dogs, you know, some really exciting animals. Some of them not so exciting, rats and things, but they all had a love of the animals. They all wanted to, they were doing it really to gain some sense of communion and meaning, to find some kind of meaning. But as soon as we got into public discourse or into dissertations or scientific papers, that, all of that was forgotten. And uh, it was you know, the usual neo-Darwinist approach. So it was semi-conscious uh, and not developed and not brought into the practice. But you're right, I think all scientists are like this. I mean, most scientists will admit to the importance of intuition in interpreting data. Interpreting data. They'll suddenly have a, a hunch about what a whole load of numbers mean, but they don't cultivate intuition. Since Alfred Einstein, that's a difficult thing to deny. Huh? That's right, yeah, he was a deeply intuitive scientist. And Lovelock, too, is a deeply intuitive. And in holistic science, we cultivate the intuition through, one way we do it is through a very careful observation of a plant, let's say. We draw the plant very carefully and then we close our eyes and we imagine how the plant took shape, how it shaped itself into its, into its fully grown form from the seed, how the seedling developed, how the leaves came out. And this teaches us to think like a plant, to think dynamically. And um, if you do this properly, you can get an intuitive insight into the nature of the plant and indeed beyond the plant into the, the dynamic nature of being itself. So it's a very, very powerful uh, method for awakening your intuitive powers. And then you can bring in the quantitative aspects if you want as well. You can make mathematical models of the development of the plant. And then you end up with a truly holistic understanding that satisfies reason, feeling, sensing and intuition simultaneously. I relate to Gaia by finding a place that's as wild as possible, that's to say, as far away from car noise, machine noise, lawn mowers as I can, a place that's been as little disturbed by humans as possible, and just spending, dwelling in such a place for as long as I can. The best thing for me is actually to escape from Britain altogether and come to somewhere like Norway where the landscape is much, much freer of human influence, where everything around you, one feels, is more doing its own thing, irrespective of human intervention, although I know, of course, there is human intervention here. That's what I need to really uh, be myself fully. Mm. That's, that could sound a bit anti-human, as mm. try to avoid the humans. Are, mm. are humans evil? No, not in the slightest. Humans are a fan wonderful, fantastic species, just that we've got slightly out, rather out of control. There are too many of us. Uh, and we're having too much of a, an effect on the world. No, but I'm not anti-human in the slightest. I think humans are a tr wonderful species, uh, but no more wonderful than any other. We're just as wonderful as bacteria. Just imagine, without the action of the bacteria, there'd be no nitrogen cycle. Without nitrogen cycle, well, we couldn't exist. So the microbes are just as wonderful as we are. I like the phrase of Aldo Leopold, we humans are just plain members of the biotic community. We're just plain members. We're not masters or stewards, we're plain members of this great community. And in fact, we can't feel fully human unless we sense that in ourselves. So we're a, we're a wonderful species. Our role, I think, is to celebrate Gaia, not to dominate or control her climate. I mean, I imagine skyscrapers would be draped with greenery. There's a Frenchman, I can't remember his name, who grows plants on the sides of skyscrapers. Factories would be smaller scale with living machines inside them, with plants inside them, and the workers would work only a few hours a day and then spend most of the time tending the gardens outside in the factory because we wouldn't need so many industrial products. So everything would be suffused with this Gaian uh, sensibility. In Gaia, what's that? Well, see, people often say I was inspired by nature or I felt great when I was outdoors. But I think it goes further than that. I mean, for me, the Earth is a great intelligence. It's actually a psyche. Um, I'm not using that metaphorically. I think the Earth actually is a psyche. And it's not just me who thinks this. I mean, many traditional, in fact, I'd probably say all traditional cultures have said this about nature. That it's actually a great psyche. Remember Plato's psyche cosmu. So we had it even in our own culture, 
before the scientific revolution. So if, if the Earth is indeed a, a great psyche, then it's possible for knowledge and intuition of that great psyche to sweep through us. It's possible that it can sweep away our habitual patterns of thought, particularly in these times, our mechanistic patterns of thought, in which we think the whole Earth to be nothing more than a dead machine. It's possible for that, all of those thoughts to be swept away by this wider understanding of the Earth as fully alive and as a psychological entity. So if I say to you, I was gired, it means that it wasn't that when I had a, an important moment in nature, let's say, it wasn't that I projected something out onto nature, which then I felt uh, was grand. It wasn't a projection. It was the other way around. It wasn't a projection from me to the world. It was the world projecting itself into me. So the world is actually an agency with that kind of power, with the power to sweep away and shake habitual patterns of thought. This happened to an American called Aldo Leopold. He's written about this in a beautiful chapter in his book, A Sand County Almanac. The chapter is called Thinking Like a Mountain. And basically, um, he was involved with wiping out wolves in the United States using the scientific method. And one day he went out into the, into the Gila wilderness in New Mexico with his friends, with rifles, um, and they sat down to have lunch. And when he sat down to have his lunch, Leopold was still in that mechanistic worldview that we've described earlier. He really thought that we humans had the right to control the world, control nature and therefore to exterminate wolves if we wanted to. And then they saw some wolves at the bottom of a river. Uh, they were sitting on a cliff and they saw some wolves and they began to shoot at this pack of wolves really excitedly. And they killed several of them. And they scrambled down a scree slope to look at one large wolf that was dying. And Leopold said something like this, there was something new to me in those eyes something known only to her, the dying wolf, and the mountain. Something known only to her and the mountain. And then it's something, he says something like, I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. And then after that, he began to say things like, uh, we humans are just plain members of the biotic community. Or, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, beauty and stability of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. He developed what he called his land ethic, in which he said, we have treated the land as a slave. That's morally wrong just as it's wrong to treat other human beings as slaves. So what happened to him in that moment must have been pretty big and pretty important if he could shift from that mechanistic worldview which he had before he sat down to have his lunch in the Gila wilderness on that bright sunny day. Um, something must have shifted him very, very radically during that experience with the wolf for him to then go on to develop this land ethic, which he did for the rest of his life, by the way. And what happened, I think, is that he was gired. In other words, he knew that the mountains, the air, the microbes in the soil, the cactus, the rocks, in fact, all of the animate surroundings had witnessed what he had done and had disapproved of it intensely. So he witnessed, he knew the surrounding environment to be animate and sentient and disapproving because he says neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view.